afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to our February lecture. Um, just call on our uh, Vice President and Convener of Events Committee, Ron Lyons, to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Kim. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second in our lecture series for 2024. The title of today's lecture is Great Power Politics and the Defence Strategic Review, and it'll be presented by Associate Professor Adam Lockyer, who is the Associate Professor in Strategic Studies at Macquarie University's Department of Security Studies and Criminology. Adam has held a number of academic positions in strategic studies in Australia and the United States. He was the Lowy Institute's 2008 Thorley Scholarship uh, in International Security winner and held the 2015 Fulbright Scholarship in US-Australian Alliance Studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Adam was awarded his PhD in Political Science from the University of Sydney in 2009. Adam's current book project is exploring the operational dimensions of conventional maritime deterrence. Adam last spoke to us in August 2022, and it's a pleasure to welcome him back to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor Adam Lockyer. Uh, thank you, Ron, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so I was invited to speak to you today on the Defence Strategic Re Review. Uh, it's come out to 12 months since it was made public, and we thought that an overview of the review would be a timely contribution. The problem, however, is that over the last almost 12 months, a lot has been said about the DSR. Um, a lot needs to be said, but a lot has already been said. So what could I possibly say that was going to be new or interesting was the challenge. But having a look at what has been said and written about the DSR over the almost 12 months, it, most scholars uh, and commentators have narrowed in on certain aspects of the DSR that particularly interest them. So they're part of the ship, is this part of the document and so they've narrowed down on that particular aspect and gone into some detail about what the DSR says about their part of the ship and the implications thereof. So rather than trying to get down into the weeds of the DSR, what I thought I might do today is do the opposite and take a really big, and I'm going to mean really, really big, step back and try and put the DSR into some kind of broader geopolitical context and have a look at what great power competition means for the DSR. So uh, that's, that's my introduction slide. So what I thought I might do is begin by discussing a little bit about strategic storytelling. And one place we could begin is what I think is was a master class in strategic storytelling which was the 86 Dib report. So the Dib report has many admirable aspects to it uh, regardless of what you think about the conclusions and what it argued and the recommendations if you read the Dib report as a piece of scholarship it has many admirable uh, aspects to it. Um, it's deductive, it's logically coherent, uh, and it has internal validity. And what I mean by that is if you follow the premises, it leads you to the conclusions. So my students back at Macquarie University this year, my first years were born in 2006. All right, so when I think about the Dib report in 86, this is ancient history to them. All right, this is not part of their lived experience at all. Um, September 11 isn't even part of their lived experience. But I can explain the Dib report fairly simply. All right? We can talk about these key aspects of the Dib report. These are, you can call these the conceptual building blocks. Uh, some of the foundational principles, um, or in terms of storytelling, these are some of the premises that Dib was using as a foundation for his analysis. So if you were to, uh, first off, 
tell your undergrads who are 18 years old, born in 2006, uh, here are some of the foundational principles that we're going to be built off. First, that Australia faces no serious risk of military attack. Back in 86, you can make that claim. Uh, and you've got to have 10 years of warning time before a serious uh, military, conventional military attack could be uh, contemplated on Australia. Our sea lanes of communication are secure and are not threatened, even in war. Um, once again, uh, back in 86, this was the case, not the case anymore. Uh, Australia has an air sea gap to the north of the country, which we can use as a geostrategic moat around the country. Uh, concentric circles, an interesting idea, one that says that things that happen closer to Australia are more threatening to it than things that happen far away. So events in Port Moresby are going to be more important to Australia's security than things that happen in Morocco. The flip side, however, is that because of the nature of military power, and it, uh, it decreases over distance, we are more able to influence events in Port Moresby than we are in Morocco. So things that are closer to Australia are more important to us, Think, but we can also do more to mitigate and respond to them, and we can move out in concentric circles based upon that principle. Uh, ANZUS was a critical part, uh, although self-reliance was also emphasised. ANZUS allows Australia a unique opportunity to get high-end technology, which gives us a qualitative advantage over our near neighbours. And finally, self-reliance, um, the idea that Australia should be able to respond to contingencies in its near region, uh, at least at the low and medium level of threshold. If you would explain these to an undergrad, right, an 18 year old, and say these are our building blocks, these are the premises that we're going to build upon, they can then come to more or less the right answers, right? You say, so given that, what should we buy? All right? And they come to with the same type of shopping list that Dib recommended. Right? They can say that we need, well, we need to over the horizon radar. Uh, they might not use this language, but I'll say we need to be able to see a long way. We have to emphasize uh, naval and air capabilities to uh, control or to be able to repulse threats through a northern approaches, exploring the SE gap, and that the army will largely act like a strategic goalkeeper uh, and, and sort of clean up anyone who washes ashore um, from the Navy and Air Force has a go at them. So you can take these premises and it leads you to these conclusions, right? There's a, a relationship between the two of these. Now, once again, I don't agree with all these conclusions, but it makes sense. It's logically coherent within the document. If we now fast forward to the DSR and we start to look at the strategic storytelling in the DSR, um, I have the, personally, I have the opposite response to the strategic storytelling in the DSR where I agree with the, um, many of the conclusions, but how it gets you there is one of the weakest parts of the document. So, for example, it starts off really strongly. It says that no longer is our alliance partner, the United States, the unipolar leader in the Indo-Pacific. Intense China-United States competition is the defining feature of our region and our time. Uh, major power competition in our region has the potential to threaten our interests, including the potential for conflict. That's a really strong hook to grab the reader and pull them in to what they want, what the, uh, the authors want you to, to conclude. However, if we then break it down into the premises of that statement, right? One, the United States, is, is our alliance partner, is no longer the unipolar leader in the Indo-Pacific. Its relative power is diminishing, China's power is rising. Intense China-US competition is a defining feature, cool. Third, major power competition in our region has the potential to threaten our interests. So we don't want major power competition because it threatens our interests. If you were to take those three premises and put them together, what would be your conclusions? All right. So to the average punter on the street, right, and this is, once again, this is not my view, but if you were to take these as the conceptual building blocks upon which you're going to base your argument, you could argue 
that if major power competition in a region has the potential to threaten your interest, you want to avoid that. Right? And the best way to avoid that would be to convince the United States to not enter into the competition in the first place. Right? If that would be the logical, uh, could possibly be one of the logical conclusions if you took these, uh, these premises. So American power is decreasing, American, uh, Chinese power is increasing, is on the rise. So the average punt on the street might ask, well, why are we siding with a loser? Right? Uh, why, are you just, why are you siding with the side that's on the down rather than the side that's up? Once again, this is not my, these aren't my conclusions. It's just the storytelling doesn't lead you to the conclusion, doesn't necessarily lead you to the conclusions that the document wants you to lead you to. So the conclusion it leads to is our alliance with the United States is becoming even more important to Australia. Uh, this will increasingly include working more closely with the Americans and other partners. So once again, I just want to emphasise that's the correct answer. That's the I, th I think that's the correct conclusion, but the storytelling doesn't necessarily lead you to that conclusion. The other part of the DSR, which you might be able to point to as weak storytelling, is some of the imprecision in some of the language. So. We talk about uh, China's assertion of sovereignty over the South China Seas, threatens the global rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific in a way that adversely impacts Australia's national interests. There's a lot in there that's imprecise. Uh, first off, the rules-based order. All right. What is the rules-based order? All right. What are the rules? Where are they written down? All right. If you want a precision, you'd say international law. Right, international law is written down, whereas rules are a bit more flexible. And the reason why the United States and, by ex and in part Australia has preferred the rules-based order over international law is because rules are a little bit more malleable, uh, a little bit imprecise, gives you a bit of wriggle room. Uh, whereas international law is the back letter of the law and it applies equally to everyone, including the United States, when the United States, as when it was hegemon, wanted sort of one rules for you, maybe not quite apply equally to us. Uh, likewise, Indo-Pacific is part of the accepted rhetoric now, in part because it means different things to different actors. If you ask the Germans or the French what the Indo-Pacific is, they love the term because it captures all the way across the Indian Ocean and captures large parts of uh, eastern side of Africa. Right? Whereas in the United States, they like the Indo-Pacific because it largely overlaps with uh, the area of responsibility of the Seventh Fleet. Uh, and in Australia, we like it because it kind of captures Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So it means different things to different actors. Uh, once again, if you want to compare it back to the Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific was far more defined, right? Because you had, you had APEC, and if you're a member of APEC, you're in Asia Pacific. Um, and whereas Indo Pacific is a bit more blurred about where it actually starts and where it ends. And then there's some inconsistencies uh, in the strategic storytelling. So as a consequence, so, so I'll just highlight here, as a consequence of all these changes happening on in the region, for the first time in 80 years, we must go back to fundamentals and take a first principles approach. So we're going to go back and start from a clean sheet of paper and we're going to start again. But Another part, they'll say that uh, every Australian government since Federation has assessed our strategic circumstances and reaffirmed the centrality of an alliance partnership, which argues that we're going to do it because we've always done it, right? So there's some um, inconsistencies in the argument and the strategic storytelling as well. So what I thought I'd do is today is take a big step back and try to arrive at a different story. So how could we arrive at many of the same conclusions that are in the DSR, but take the journey that is gonna be a bit more uh, deductive, a bit more logical and a bit more coherent and be able to carry the audience um, and public opinion with us on our journey, the same way that arguably the DIB report was able to do. So let's go back and start with the fundamentals. So I'm going to sort of cover 
great powers to begin with, what they are and what they want. Um, how does the Australian-American alliance play into great power competition? And how does the DSR relate to uh, America's China strategy? Okay, so let's go take one really big step back and start with what international relations tells us about great powers. And what international relations scholarship will tell you about great powers is that ultimately great powers want to survive. It is a hostile, competitive world out there and great powers, like all states, value their security more than almost anything else. And so their ultimate objective is survival. And great powers go about this one of, or, or two ways really. The first way is they seek out hegemony, so to dominate their region. Uh, if you are by far the most powerful actor in your region, this is going to contribute to your um, to, to your survival and your own security. Outside of your region, you'll, you want to uh, extend your security zone for as long as you can. So this is like a, a buffer region between you and the other great powers in order to, once again, ultimately provide security. And if we have a quick look at American history, you can see these two, um, two motivations in how the United States has gone, around, gone about building itself up as a great power. So for the first century of its existence, the United States was surrounded by hostile great powers. The Spanish, the British, the French, all had territories on, in, in North America that were threatening to uh, the, the young United States. Uh, in addition to that, there were indigenous populations to the West that threatened the new United States. Um, security. It, it, wasn't in a, uh, it wasn't in possession of a first class navy and so it relied on the good graces of the European powers uh, in order to protect its sea lanes of communication. So how did the United States respond? Well it very quickly um, expanded westward and so through a combination of major land purchases, of war, of annexation, uh, it was able to expand westward and go from the original 13 colonies on the east coast and pushed westward all the way through to the Pacific. And so while the United States was assuming the borders that we currently, uh, it, it currently enjoys, Events in South America were also favorable to American emerging hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. So as the United States expanded westward, the colonies of South and Central America were slowly getting their independence from their European colonizers. And what the Americans did through the Monroe Doctrine is it signaled to the Europeans that uh, once they were kicked out by the uh, South Americans, Central Americans, that they weren't going to be welcomed back in. So through a combination of westward expansion of the independence movements through Central and South America, and through the Monroe Doctrine, the United States was able to become the hegemon of the Western Hemisphere and it had two large oceans on either side of it, Pacific and the Atlantic, um, which acted as its security zone. So a combination of hegemony in the Western Hemisphere and these two large uh, security zones allowed the United States to uh, enjoy the security of in what it has enjoyed through most of the 20th century um, and arguably besides the partial exception of the second world war and the attack on pearl harbor um, most of america's wars through the 20th century have been um, large have largely been um, uh, wars of choice rather than being compulsed to act uh, because it has enjoyed hegemony in its own region and its two large security zones. And if we have a look at other great powers through history, you can see that there has been this underlying uh, uh, 
motive to try to establish hegemony first in their region followed by security zones. So England first established hegemony over the British Isles before gaining security zones through, through dominating the sea. And the Soviet Union after the Second World War first gained hegemony through Eastern Europe and had the security zone of the uh, Eastern European states uh, in, the East, uh, in the Soviet bloc as a buffer, buffer zone between Soviet Russia and the, the Western states. So you can see this pattern emerging, that this is what states want to achieve. So is hegemony good or bad? Well, it depends. Um, so the provision of public goods, so this is secure sea lanes communication, this is international organisations, um, free and fair trade around the world, uh, suffers from, uh, they're, they're public goods, meaning that whether or not you actively contribute to uh, maritime security or you don't, you can enjoy the benefits of maritime security if it's applied by others. So what that means is that there's a strong incentive to free ride. That if others are going to supply this global security through the global commons, then you can kick back and just reap the benefits without actually making um, a contribution yourself. So through the Red Sea now, we see that the United States is attempting to perform the function of a global hegemon, of providing um, global maritime security through the sea lanes communication, and there's a uh, motive, motive amongst some to just free ride on this public good that the Americans are going to supply. So overcoming this free ride problem often means that there has to be a hegemon, right? a dominant power that can both coerce and entice other states to contribute to a global effort to maintain security. But it means to overcome this, you need a hegemon that's both able and willing to provide the public goods. So Kindleberger uh, back in uh, 1973 argued that the Great Depression was actually caused by the fact that there wasn't a great power that was able to perform these functions. They were both willing and able to do so. So whereas the British were willing to uphold global trade, but were unable to do so because of its uh, declining power following the First World War, um, it wasn't able to do so, although it was willing. The United States, on the other hand, was able because it was a, a rising power, but it was unwilling because it was, un, it was uh, living through a, a period of isolationism. And so without a global power that was, able to, that was both willing and able to, to supply these public goods, the consequence was the Great Depression. So for Australia's security. Um, it's long been recognised that having a great power in the first in Britain and later the United States that was both willing and able um, to provide global public goods has been in Australia's interest. And so we have contributed to maritime security and holding um, the global order uh, that the United States constructed after the Second World War in large part because we see this as being in our interests. Um, just to make the point though, it, although we see this as being in our interests, not everybody does. So whether or not hegemony is good or bad is actually, depends a lot on which side you find yourself on the, the end of. So life under British hegemony, for example, varied a great deal depending upon which end of colonisation one found itself. So hegemony can be good, um, but can be bad. So we've looked at the Soviet Union, we've looked at Britain, we've looked at the United States, we've seen how they've risen to great power status and then sought hegemony in their region followed by a, constructing a security zone around themselves. Now fighting a war to gain hegemony however is a very risky business. All right? So if you have a look through history at some wars of um, that have, been, have sought regional hegemony. So France under Louis XIV, uh, Napoleon, German, Germany's two world wars, uh, Germany, uh, Japan's attempt to establish a hegemonic order in Asia. 
they've all resulted in defeat. And these are not small defeats either. Uh, we've seen that these millions have died, uh, nations have been destroyed, and leaders have been ended up in exile, imprisoned, or dead. So considering the extreme costs of hegemonic war, uh, War is not necessarily a consequence of a rising power. Um, we've seen the, the consequences of hegemonic war, and so there's, it's not ultimately going to be uh, the path that China is going to follow. So we have a look at the, what China now, and if we have a look at what great powers do and what their, their aims are, nothing that China is currently doing should surprise us. So on the one hand, it's seeking t um, to become the dominant political player in Asia. It's attempting to carve out a security zone for itself through, um, th through its near seas, down through the South China Sea. Um, and none of this should surprise anybody. None of this is necessarily bad. It's what great powers seek to do. Um, and this doesn't necessarily go to end in necessarily war um, because it can be deterred from seeking outright hegemony through war because we've seen what the consequences of such wars often are. So whether or not how this is all going to play out is going to depend not just on what China does, but on how the United States seeks to respond to the rise of China. So since 79, uh, we've lived through a period known as the Asian peace, and it's been founded upon Amer American military primacy uh, through Asia. And the Americans themselves believe that uh, their presence and their domination military uh, primacy through East Asia has been, a has been the major contributing factor to this Asian peace. Uh, it's been able to contribute to strategic stability, um, the international regional trade, and democracy promotion through Asia. Um, Hillary Clinton referred to the United States as the indispensable mm. uh, uh, nation uh, because of the role it has played as global hegemon. All right, so how will the United States respond to the, the, the China challenge? Right? And ultimately, there are four different ways that the United States could respond or could attempt to respond to the rise of China. The first is to attempt continued primacy. So here you'd see the United States attempt to outmatch China's power, roll it back, um, and then before trying to bottle up Chinese power and reduce its influence through the region. Uh, this would be a major task and whether or not that would be even uh, feasible is open to question. The next would be a favourable balance of power. So here it wouldn't be outright primacy through Asia, it would be that the United States would seek to be the dominant power but within some kind of a balance, right? So a balance doesn't necessarily mean 50-50 split like scales. The scales could be tilted one way or the other. And if the scales are tilted so that the United States remains the more uh, powerful nation along with its allies, um, this means that China will remain subservient to the, the current structures and order of the region. So. This is generally accepted as being, um, would, would, made, would require a major national effort on the United States' behalf, as well as its allies through the region stepping up um, to, to confront China, the, the challenge of China. So depending upon the China's response, however, it may not uh, be happy with remi remaining the weaker actor within Asia, and it could lead to more competition, arms races, and the security dilemma. The other side is the scales are tilted so that it's somewhat in China's favour. Uh, however, it, it doesn't can't rise to primacy. So the United States' power and influence through Asia remains such that China's uh, hegemony is blocked 
and uh, prevent it from a, to, to rising to that particular status. So this would be an unfavorable balance of power in Asia, unfavorable to the United States. Uh, it acknowledges that the balance of power has already tilted in, Asia, in China's favor, and the United States would then work with its allies and friends to prevent China's hegemony across all dimensions, strategic, political, and economic. Uh, it's more of an anti-hegemonic approach, so just preventing the, China from getting hegemony rather than trying to acquire hegemony itself. It would seek to resist, punish, and prevent rather than impose or dominate, and on the strategic front, it would be mostly associated with the strategy of denial. Uh, that's political denial rather than sea denial, which gets confused. Um, finally, you can just throw your hands up in the air and say we're beat and walk away. Accommodation. All right? And just say this would aim to reduce the mutual threat through restraint. Uh, it would acknowledge, that China's interests, would acknowledge China's interests and seek to accommodate them. Uh, to varying degrees, it would accept China's leadership in Asia, if not hegemony or military primacy. So these are more or less the four different ways that the United States could attempt uh, to respond to the rise of China. Uh, the signals coming from the United States are somewhat mixed. Trump argued that it would try to remain the dominant actor in Asia. However, the Biden administration has advocated for integrated deterrence. Uh, and this has become the new buzzword in Washington. And it argues that all, uh, all elements of national power need to be integrated across the, the domains, economic, military, diplomatic, cyber. Uh, it expects its allies to do far more. Um, so it's what a state would probably attempt to do if it was pursuing an unfavorable balance of power in the region. And the American think tanks have started to think along these lines as well. So over the last five, 10 years, it goes by different names, tightening the chain, um, uh, you know, uh, the porcupine strategy, um, defending the first island chain, uh, inside out strategy, Every think tank comes with a new little buzzword to attempt to uh, explain something that is, is largely captured by this integrated deterrence idea, which is you'd have an inside force and an outside force. The inside force would stretch from uh, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, down through the Philippines, reaching down to Australia and Singapore, and this would be your inside force. And here, um, the forces would need to uh, be survivable in the first ex salvo exchange, followed by reinforcements coming from the outside in order, and this would be largely the United States, coming from Hawaii and uh, the West Coast, to surge across to reinforce its allies uh, wherever and whenever the conflict breaks out. So, here you have uh, different ways of thinking about this. Um, sometimes it's viewed as being a bit like a, a blue side um, A to AD, where you're trying to um, any access area denial through the first island chain before the cavalry arrives from the United States um, uh, seventh and third fleet. Okay, so now I'm going to pivot around to how the DSR sort of fits in with this view. Now, historically, the defence debate in Australia has been, has been divided into two main camps, broadly. Um, they've gone by different names, different times, by different people. Uh, Michael Evans, um, uh, down in Canberra, um, calls it the creswell forrester divide. But ultimately, you can sort of say there's two broad camps within Australian defence circles. First, the Ford defence camp, that argues that Australia is too large and its population is too, sl uh, too small to defend itself. And so uh, its, uh, its relative security as a long-term, uh, its, its security uh, it, it needs a global hegemon uh, in order to provide security for in the global commons. Um, and it's in Australia's interests to help buttress the hegemon's uh, power and position. So to that end, uh, we might contribute to uh, the Korean War, Vietnam, uh, all the way back to the Sudan, where buttressing the global hegemon's power and position is in, ultimately in Australia's uh, long-term interests. 
The other camp would be a bit more of the traditional defence camp, which argues for the defence of Australia. Um, so here, um, the main argument would be that Australia would be foolish to entrust its defence on another self-interested actor, particularly one with global interests. Uh, Australia's geography should be the starting point for any discussion of defence, and therefore we move into um, a discussion of uh, SA gap, concentric circles, and all the DIB stuff. Um, so if you have a look at, uh, this is taken from the DIB report back in 86, uh, have a look at all the different zones around Australia and the priorities of each. So the northern approaches would be the priority, uh, followed by the others. So if we then pivot back to the, hold that thought in your mind for a moment, and then you pivot back to the DSR. And so these two visions of Australian defence kind of converge in the DSR. So in terms of investment in long-term precision strike, um, that the army should be uh, able to operate through the islands and the archipelagos to Australia's immediate uh, north. What you see is a convergence of both the forward defence mindset and the defence of Australia mindset. So if you had had those are more associated with the forward defence school of thought, say the Robert Hills of the world, um, if Robert Hill had written the DSR, many of the conclusions would have been the same. Right? If you had have commissioned DIB to write you know, the, the DIB report part two, the, many of the conclusions would have been very similar. Um, defending the Australia's northern approaches through long, long range position strike, getting the army in particular and navy out the front foot um, and having an Australian version of A to AD through the archipelago to Australia's north would have been a convergence of the two. The reason for that is if we have a look back to integrated deterrence, if the, the United States is seeking to have this defensive chain running through East Asia all the way down to Australia, then the region that the DSR is talking about would be the last link in the chain down on the southern end. We would be the last link in the chain. So if you're in the forward defence mindset of buttressing American power, of helping the Americans uh, maintain their position in East Asia and contributing to American strategy overall, then upholding that last link in the chain would be how we would go about it. On the other side, a continental defence um, mindset would largely lead you to the same conclusion because this would be Australia's near region, maritime, um, maritime approaches to Australia's north. These are all, this is the region that the DIB report followed by the 87 uh, defence white paper sought to emphasise all the way back in the day. So we, what we see is a convergence between these two schools. Uh, no matter where you start, for defence or continental defence, you're going to end up with many of the same conclusions, and they're the conclusions that are in the DSR. So how could you come back to the strategic storytelling in the DSR in order to tell a compelling story that would let my 18-year-old undergrads to the, many of the conclusions that are in the DSR? Well, you could tell a story that's both compelling and deductive by first off saying we've got these two different schools of thought, uh, forward defence and continental defence. Um, second, with the um, rise of China, um, it's not in Australia's interest for China to gain hegemony over East Asia, in part because of um, outstanding questions about its willingness and ableness to supply public goods. It's much better for the United States to, to remain the supplier of public goods if, if able. Uh, premise three is that the United States seeks to deny China hegemony by partnering with its allies through its integrated defence through the first island chain. If you take those three different principles, it would lead you to the conclusion that an archipelago defence through Australia's northern maritime approaches, so the Indo-Pacific arc and the um, Melanesian arc, is both in line with both forward defence and continental defence thinking. That would be 
the, I think that would be the logical conclusion from those three premises. So the strategic storytelling would lead you to the conclusions if you began to tell it that way. Um, and so regardless of where you, you began the story, it would end up being much at the same type of conclusions that were in the DSR and that might help us uh, explain to the Australian public why we need to increase defence spending and we need these new capabilities to come online as quickly as possible, but it also help us explain why our military build-up is necessary to the regional partners. Uh, one of the benefits of having a compelling strategic story to tell to people is not just to the public but also to other uh, nations in the Indo-Pacific to explain why we need all this new kit. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Very good question. Um, I think that the United States is paying an increasingly uh, uh, focused. Uh, uh, it depends on who you're talking about. This is why I'm getting confused because the United States is a big, big place, right? So uh, I think within the strategic circles within the United States, Australia is looming increasingly large within its thinking, um, increasingly about well, how. Do we use Australia? Do we just use it as for strategic depth? Uh, do we use it as um, a launch pad? How can we use Australia as a piece of territory? Uh, but also in terms of a contributing partner to any future war. Within strategic circles, I think that's right. Um, outside of um, you know, the Pentagon and uh, the people who think about those strategic issues, uh, probably Australia is still not front of mind for many. Um, AUKUS, I think, has elevated Australia's position within the consciousness of many in the United States. Um, uh, you now hear Australia mentioned more in Congress and other places, um, but you know, I think opinion is split on you know, AUKUS over there. Um, it would be interesting to see if Trump wins end of the year um, and his willingness to contribute, contribute to or selling the Virginia classes to Australia, um, particularly with the whole America first mentality um, and probably a distrust of others in terms of if we do end up in, um, in conflict with China, whether or not it could then re just rely upon Australian SSNs to join the fray. Um, if Biden wins, then I think AUKUS will continue and um, it will continue at least for the next short period. Now, I'm going to a member of uh, Lucy. Um, I'd like to ask you, um, the strategy that you've shown there uh, to me looks like um, Australian strategy if uh, Crown Koshik had won his civil war. Um, given that we've got a totalitarian government and possibly a Stalin-like leader in Beijing, shouldn't our strategy be a little bit more um, urgent, if you like? Um, yeah, I mean, urgencies, uh, so um, in, in terms of time frame, yeah, I mean, so I think there is um, increasing urgency. Uh, it's it's um, the DSR um, has had, I don't visit Canberra all that often, once every couple of months, um, but the 
DSR seems to have had an impact on defence. Um, one of the reasons why they went to an independent review and gave it the weighting it did was because the government really wanted to put defence's feet to the fire. Um, you know, over, over years, the government has been screaming at defence, uh, this is increasingly urgent, we need you to move quickly, um, start making decisions, and trying to get defence moving has been frustrating. Um, it's a massive organisation and trying to get uh, momentum behind it uh, has been difficult. So part of the DSR has just been frustration with defence um, and trying to just whip them and get them going. Um, so I think that within government particularly, um, there is an increasing urgency um, in terms of trying to uh, thinking that you know, a serious conflict could be on the near horizon rather than in the distant horizon, um, but then trying to get you know, the capabilities out the other end uh, is a major effort. Chris Skinner, a uh, member of Brucey. Uh, two quick comments and then a question. Um, firstly, um, I, I think it's uh, rather uh, too early to talk about the US as the loser in the uh, competition with China. Uh, they're very resilient and uh, have proven that in the past. Um, my other quick comment is that um, in the various uh, options and, and discussion, which was very profound, and, and I hope gets wider circulation, because your last slide uh, is a much be better and more compelling uh, description of what the VSR is all about, and I hope that gets publicised. Um, nevertheless, the multipolar world in, in which we now live depends a great deal on international trade and globalisation and I don't think you've given that sufficient recognition in your discussion. Um, my question though is, you, you talked about the defence of Australia as we should be self-reliant and defend ourselves, but from what? Everybody admits that an invasion of the mainland Australia is the least likely outcome. Far more likely is a cyber attack or uh, attack on trade shipping on which we rely uh, or other interference uh, economically and so on. So um, is, doesn't that change the whole equation? Now, some, yeah, some really good points there. Um, the, the, the line that America's the loser was supposed to be provocative. Um, I don't believe that, of course. Uh, this was more in terms of uh, if you follow the logic of the DSR, um, you, my 18 year old, hypothetical 18 year olds back at Macquarie University could conclude why we side the loser. Um, so it wasn't meant to be that they are the loser. Um, and global trade, very good point. Um, and I would link that back to the discussion of the hegemon being necessary in order to provide public goods. Um, part of public goods is maritime security through the sea lanes communication, um, global trade, right? um, good order at sea. Uh, if you don't have a hegemon and everyone starts to look after themselves, that begins to break down and security through the global commons becomes more difficult. Right? So we need, don't need, but it, it, it's facilitated by a, a, a global hegemon that's both able and willing. And that's the reason why we should s s side with the United States in argument. That's the argument for it. All right? um, and you could argue that you know, uh, what's happening in the Red Sea right now with the United States stepping up right, and trying to build a coalition around itself is you know, evidence of the fact of American leadership and how it's good for Australia, um, even though our contribution has been sort of there but ma more marginal. Um, so Global trade is important, uh, hegemony, and um, defend from what? Defend from what? Yeah, good question. Uh, so, yeah, no, it's the when you're reading the DSR, you're always trying to read between the lines and saying, what are we defending from? And the logic within the DSR seems to be that it's a, a rather minor threat, not a minor threat, but it's a conventional threat that's on the smaller end. So it would. It seems to be when I'm reading the DSR and trying to picture what type of contingency they're really talking about, it would be that there's been an outbreak of, may, a 
great power competition between the United States and China. The great, the main theatres will be uh, through far much further north than us, probably around Taiwan. Uh, but there may be small contingents that will break away and head towards Australia in order to con convince, deter, compel uh, the Australian government to either stay on the sidelines or um, to tie us up so that we can't contribute to anything else, right? So you're too busy with um, a small number of, uh, of Chinese ships or vessels, submarines, whatever. Um, and so that seems to be one part of it. Um, and the other part is um, that, um, that Australian defence will be uh, improved by a successful American strategy vis-a-vis -vis China and so here, this is how we can make a me um, the most meaningful contribution, being that last link in the chain that spread that links all the way up to Japan and South Korea. So I think that's the idea. Um, but I think, of course, you're right. Like, um, and if you were thinking about different contingencies that we need to worry about, uh, cyber is an obvious one. Um, you know, undersea cables. If you want to just compel us to do something, just start cutting our cables. Um, and what are you going to do about it? Um, there's a whole bunch of ways that China could apply political pressure on Australia in order to um, try to get us to redirect our policy, change our policy, um, beyond conventional attack. Um, but I don't think th those, those, those two other contingencies, I think, uh, what the DSR had in mind. Um, but I'm just reading between the lines here. Thank you. I'm uh, Ryan Nettle from the RAN. Uh, my question is, with the current instability in the Chinese economy being leading uh, China to be more or less likely to lead, uh, attack or cause conflict? Um, very, very good question. Um, so, very good question. Um, I'm not a China specialist, um, and even when you speak to China experts, they'll argue that what happens around Xi Jinping and his decision making is a black box. Right? We're not really sure about how decisions are made, and you really need to get into the psychology of Xi Jinping to, in order to answer that question. Right? Um, but it's a very good question. Um, I'll take a step back and just sort of think more in terms of whether or not we can um, treat China at the same way that we, we uh, approached the Soviet Union. Right? And one of the reasons why the Cold War was reasonably stable was because both the Soviet Union and the United States believed that the internal contradictions of their rival economic uh, systems was going to lead to internal collapse. So both the Soviet Union was happy just to wait it out, right? The United States and capitalism, capitalism, according to Marx, needs to continually expand in new markets. When it had gobbled up all of the third world and the whole world had become a communist, then they would have their own revolution and the Soviet Union would expand its borders. At the same time, you go all the way back to the long telegram um, and it argued that the internal economic uh, contradictions of the Soviet Union would mean it would collapse. None of that, you don't hear any of that in regards to China. Um, we spoke about the United States being resilient um, and the United States economy has proven time and again to rebound from depressions and recessions. We haven't seen something similar happen in China just yet. Um, so we're not sure about the resilience of the Chinese economy, whether or not it goes into recession, even into depression, and whether or not it's going to be able to rebound or it's going to go, for, it's just going to get stuck there forever. Um, aging population, environmental problems, it has its own internal challenges. And so whether or not we can just wait China out and wait for it to, um, it, its power to at least plateau, if not decrease, and this is how we're going to resolve the child problem? Maybe. Um, but you don't hear as 
people as confident that China is just going to collapse internally um, as they were during the Cold War, uh, which means that we need to approach it differently. Um, and so rather than thinking in terms of the Soviet Union, uh, probably a, if you're looking for a historical analogy, you might be thinking more in terms of Germany, right? Uh, particularly since after unification in 1871, um, it became not just the largest and most populous uh, country in Europe, it was the beating heart, it was the central actor in Europe. And so most of the 20th century has been the states of Europe trying to find a way for Germany to be the leader of Europe without being a threat, right? And we had to fight two world wars um, and the EU has been um, a program designed in order for Germany to be a leader without being a threat, right? Um, and a part of that is this, um, this balancing within Europe where France and others are able to balance in this unfavorable balancing, right? Um, but uh, prevent Germany from becoming the hegemon Right, of, of Europe. And so probably a similar kind of enterprise would need to be looked at for Asia, um, where China isn't going to go away, um, even if its economy does struggle. Um, whether that in the immediate short term leads to war, don't know. Um, but I think that coming with some kind of, how, how, does, how does the region ha have China as the most economically powerful, militarily powerful geopolitical centre of the region, but yet can block it from gaining hegemony and everyone's sort of somewhat comfortable with its leadership. That's a challenge, right? Um, and um, hopefully that sort of spoke to that challenge. Chris Bolton, Bruce, can you hear me? Okay? Yes, I can, yeah, hi. Um, my question concerns um, fuel reserves and uh, the fact that a tanker comes into Sydney Harbour and a Botany Bay every few days. It seems to me very simple that um, one tanker or several tankers could be knocked off and we're in no position to do anything about it. Have you any comments? Um, yeah, so I mean my comment there would be to, um, I think we're getting so if we're now in the um, in the space where we can just uh, spitball different ways of hurting Australia, and they're unlimited, right? We can spend all day here thinking about all the vulnerabilities and listing them off and saying how we're going to avoid, um, how we're going to sec secure ourselves or mitigate these um, these threats. And the answer is we can't, right? Because we've got an another uh, party somewhere else that can equally sit down and. Uh, brainstorm different ways of applying coercive pressure on Australia. Um, one of, uh, I was at Defence West probably two years ago now, and the Chief of Army stood up and said something really interesting. Um, and he said, he was talking about, this was before the DSR, but he knew the writing was on the wall already. And he was trying to make the argument that uh, after the Defence of Australia policy in the 1980s and through the 1990s, that uh, the Defence Force was never used in the way envisaged by Dib or, or Beasley and all that mob, right? And that was interesting because it, it, it never does, right? Because the, the, mo the moment you design your Defence Forces for one threat, the moment you begin training for one threat, one type of threat, you immediately make that threat less likely to occur, right? Because the other side aren't stupid, right? And the other side isn't going to play to the way that you want to play. And so this whole throwaway line that uh, you know, strategic thinkers are terrible at predicting the next war, that we always prepare for the wrong war, the last war. Uh, however you use the ADF is always in a way that it was neither equipped or trained to do, right? Of course. Right? Because the other side isn't going to play by your playbook. As soon as you start training equipment for one threat, it becomes less likely to occur. So as soon as you start to uh, announce something like the DSR and say we're going to put long range position strike, we're going to go into the archipelago, we're going to be able to um, defend ourselves from 
small numbers of Chinese warships sailing through the archipelago towards Australia if there's ever a major war. That threat is less likely to occur because you're, you're doing that. Right? They'll go off and do something else, like attack your tankers or attack your uh, undersea cables or use economic coercion, attack offshore oil rigs. Right? They'll do something else that you weren't planning for. So in the ADF, the moment you start to train for one thing, you make that thing less likely to occur, at least in a strategic sense, like fires and natural... That's a, that's a thing. But you're, in a strategic sense, the Chinese aren't going to play to your to your strengths, right? They'll always try and work around it and innovate around it. Um, another way to, um, to think about this is uh, one of the greatest military disasters apparently of, all, like, of, of modern history, the Maginot Line, right? Um, it's, it's often accepted that the Maginot Line was a failure. It, did, it, it didn't deter Germany from attacking France the way it was supposed to. But it kind of did too, right? Because it deterred the Germans from attacking the way that the French thought they were going to attack. So the Germans had to innovate around and come with a new strategy, a new technique of, of innovating around the Maginot Line. It deterred the type of war the French had expected. Right? So you always get a different type of conflict. Um, and so what the, I don't know much about the DSR, but if the DSR was fully implemented in, in, in the way that its, it's uh, authors envisaged, the one thing I do know is the Chinese aren't going to take that way. Right? Um, they'll think of another way of circumventing that strategy and those capabilities because they're just not going to play to your, to your strengths. Uh, David Lewis, uh, uh, I'm uh, chair of this special group on strategy in the uh, industry. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I thought it was excellent. And thank you for the way you've uh, answered our questions this afternoon. That too was very, very helpful. Um, I'm rather interested in uh, these two concepts that you say the, uh, have been melded in the DSR, forward defence and continental defence. Um, I think one difficulty with the melding is that uh, while that made quite a bit of sense in the uh, Second War, in the war in the Pacific, uh, when uh, Britain owned Malaya and Singapore and the Dutch owned um, what is now Indonesia and uh, we owned New Guinea, um, in the post-colonial era um, it makes less sense. It's to try to get forward defence in that area. Uh, because there's no guarantee that our, our good neighbours will allow us to put forward bases on their territory. Uh, they might. Uh, but Indonesia, on several occasions, on, uh, not only have we had problems with Indonesia, but in, in, even more recently they've said that they uh, won't allow overflight by Australian uh, warplanes in certain circumstances. Uh, Papua New Guinea is uh, work, working quite closely with China as well as with Australia, allowing China to develop an air base uh, on Mars Island while we are uh, developing a naval base in conjunction with the United States. And I can go on. But I just wonder how you see that issue developing. Looking forward. forward. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, that was one of the big question marks uh, on when I was writing the margins uh, about that and it was uh, pretty clear that nobody from DFAT was involved with the writing of the DSR uh, because that was, would be the very first thing that they would, um, they would ask. Um, so you want to make the um, army uh, more maritimely focused, you want them to be able to go out and uh, deny these, uh, th these approaches um, through land-based anti-ship ballistic missiles apparently. Um, how are you going to do this without asking permission from these sovereign nations that you now want to invade um, on the way to defend yourself? Um, so, I don't know, I, is, is the short answer. Um, there is always talk about um, Manus Island and the development of a joint base there and whether or not that could be a model moving forward where we have joint facilities 
spread out. So it's not we have uh, forwardly deployed assets that are working um, hand in glove with the um, host nation militaries um, to have bolster our shared um, our shared security. But that only works while um, we both have shared vision of threats further north. Um, if it's ever viewed by one of the uh, Melanesian nations, uh, the maritime Southeast Asian nations, to be in their interest to align with China, um, then all bets are off, right? Um, and this is what the DSR is silent on, and it's one of the major vulnerabilities of implementing this. Alan Murray, um, RUSI member. I just want to throw the term expeditionary deployments. It's sort of proposed here that expeditionary deployments is what we've actually done for our strategy for 150 years to integrate with our big and powerful friends. Mm -hmm. Given that uh, DIB didn't want to pay any attention to it, mm -hmm. and the DSR only goes to as far as saying we'll do expeditionary deployments in our immediate region, mm -hmm. is it actually our strategy of the last 150 years that no one dare speak its name? Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. And it would depend upon the expeditionary mission of the future. Um, so, and once again, there's a lot of wriggle room here too. Um, so I might sort of say, one, um, in terms of the DSR, in terms of current defence thinking, they're trying to be more disciplined, focused on the region. Um, but if the government of the day finds it expedient to send uh, an expeditionary mission off to Afghanistan or Iraq, um, or even you know, somewhere else, um, off they go. Um, we have uh, uh, servicemen right now off in the UK training Ukrainians. Um, you know, th th this, this idea that we're only ever going to work in the immediate region ever um, is probably unrealistic, um, considering the pressures the government's going to be come under from its partners in the future. Um, but I think there's this is one of the reasons why the Indo-Pacific is such a popular term, right? If you say the Indo-Pacific is um, our our region, right? We're in the Indo-Pacific. Um, then is the Middle East included or not? Right. Under some maps that cover Indo-Pacific, you'll find this shaded area going all the way from um, the Pacific, all the way through Asia, down through parts of the Middle East, down to Africa, right? At that point there, if this is our region, there's only sort of bits and bits of the world um, that aren't part of our region. So depending upon how you're going to define it gives the government a bit of wriggle room saying this is part of our region, we've got to get involved. Um, so um, I think that, I think, I think you're right, um, but I think that they're trying to be more disciplined in, in defence, but in the future I think we'll get back into the expeditionary game because the government will come under pressure to do so. Professor Lockyer, thank you so much for your work today. You will notice around the auditorium quite a number of things happening. Sorry? Microphone. Mike. You'll, you'll notice around the auditorium that quite a number of us are either losing hair or have white hair. That's because not we are ageing, but we are, have been grappling with the various governments, DSRs, over a long period of time. And I understand since last Tuesday with the release of the fleet review that supplies of, and sales of Valium have shot up to this particular group. That said, you came today and said, I'm going to step backwards and I'm going to tell you some stories. And you've done that exceptionally well. And I think it's a very important curative to step back and work out why it is we're trying to do something, even if there are gaps in it because I think we all have the suspicion that we're actually opting for the free ride rather than anything else in the uh, defence community. So, Adam, it's been great having you here today and I would like, first of all, to present you with a continuation of your membership 
certificate, because you have been here before, and I note that you're working on a maritime book at the moment, mm -hmm. the Matt Lowe's here, please take note, and since we intend to have a look at the maritime milieu later this year, you might find yourself somehow dragooned here again. I'm not sure what we give you at that point in time. Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to put your hands together to thank Adam for his work today?